Hello everyone, my name is Cynthia Brass Foreman. I am an entomologist, I live on San Juan Island, and today I'm going to talk to you about some bugs that can make Gary here itchy or scratchy. My presentation is titled, What's Bugging Gary? And first off, I'd have to say to cover all of these bugs, it would take a lot more than uh, 20 minutes, more like a whole college semester. That's because there are a lot of bugs associated with Gary Oaks. How many? Well, let's find out. How many? Well, there are hundreds of insect species, in fact, over 800, that are associated with Gary Oak trees. Obviously, not all of these make Gary itchy, eat his leaves or turn them yellow or brown. Some coexist with Gary, causing no problems at all in a healthy ecological community. I'd like to point out that the number of 800 is for insect species that are documented. So this isn't taking into account the species of arachnids, that would be mites, harvestmen, spiders, or even the nematodes or earthworms associated with Gary oak trees. So there are also more than 110 pathogens associated with Gary oaks. Most, however, are minor saprophytes, plants, fungi, or microorganisms that live on dead or decaying organic matter. On this slide, I have a picture of a caterpillar. This caterpillar is a Biston betularia caterpillar, the salt and pepper moth caterpillar. It is on my long checklist of insects associated with Gary Oaks um, that was uh, that was put together for um, British Columbia. And on that list, this one is listed as Biston cognitaria. But it, the list that I used um, for my presentation was compiled in 1985, and there have been many taxonomic revisions. So um, this caterpillar now uh, species is called Biston betularia cognitaria. It has been parceled out in, as a subspecies. In regards to my specimen here, this would take an experienced taxonomist to determine two species or subspecies. I found this one on San Juan Island on my mint. Um, either way, it's not on the list of pests. It is on a list of insects associated with Gary Oaks. But depending on your definition of pest, it does contribute to defoliation. All Lepidoptera caterpillars do. So, here are some of the Lepidoptera groupings that I found to be of most concern uh, as far as being pests of Gary oak trees. I have left some out, but again, all caterpillars eat leaves and they're part of the food web. So defining pest to me is somewhat subjective. So uh, first on the list, we have the Western Oak Looper. Um, it's also known by the name of Mournful Thorn Moth. Uh, the second one is the Western Tent Caterpillar, Malacosoma californicum pluvial. Then we have the Winter Moth, Operoptera brumata. I have uh, put the Bruce Fanworm Moth up there next to it, and I will fill you in on that as we move along. And then there is the Filbert Worm Larva or the Catalina Cherry Moth. Um, but again, I would just like to point out that all caterpillars eat leaves. So let's start with the Western Oak Looper or Mournful Thorn Moth. The scientific name is Lamdina fistularia somniaria. It is in the family Geometridae. And the third name tacked on means it is treated as a subspecies. And they have divided these up into subspecies attributed to their feeding preference. So um, in this group, we have a Eastern Hemlock Looper, a Western Hemlock Looper, and the Western Looper or Gary Oak Looper. And again, they are all in the family Geometridae. This one, the Western Oak Looper, is a native species. The eggs overwinter and hatch late May to mid-June, and the moth larvae are called inchworms. They feed on fir, hemlock, spruce, oaks, and other hardwoods. So they're considered a pest because they're periodic outbreaks that will last one to two years. This um, means that there's a population increase, which equals more defoliation. Um, however, there are no management guidelines um, for addressing this as a pest, um, but they do recommend interplanting um, and creating a healthy uh, community guild for Gary Oak 
uh, savannas. So um, let's see. Moving on, uh, here's the picture of the adult western oak looper or the mournful thorn moth, um, Lamdina fissilaria somniaria, and it's quite beautiful. Um, I got this photo from a friend, uh, Carl Barentine. Carl's a retired professor who lives in eastern Washington, and he's documented about 860 species of moths in the Midwest and 800 species here in the Pacific Northwest. You can find Carl's Mothing series and learn how to moth, because yes, it's a thing. Check uh, the reference section at the end of the presentation for a link if you're interested. On this slide, I have the Western Tent Caterpillar in the family Lazeocampidae. Uh, the third name, again, uh, tacked on here, Malacosoma californicum pluvial, means it is des designated as a subspecies. And I brought some eggs that I had in a container um, for everyone to see. The eggs are laid by the female shortly after adult emergence and mating in midsummer. And for San Juan Island, that would be sometime in, I would say, late July, early August. Um, the larva hatch three to four weeks later, but this is, this is interesting. They remain inside of the eggs until the following spring. So the eggs that you'll see are coated with an interesting protective hydrophilic substance or shellac called spemaline that protects the eggs, captures water when humidity is high and reduces evaporation when the air moisture is low. I have had the um, eggs that I've passed around to show everyone in my refrigerator since last March of uh, 2022. And it's, uh, it's mid-October. Um, the eggs have been taken out and handled and actually dropped all over the floor and put back in their refrigerator. And I would like to point out that they have absolutely no mold or mildew growing on them, which is very interesting to me. So the spumaline is uh, probably somewhat bacteria static as well. Larval development for western tent caterpillars is about 30 to 42 days. And these caterpillars can be parasitized by flies and wasps. On the left is an example of a tachinid fly. There are quite a few species of tachinid flies, and some of them are pretty specific to host. I just wanted to show you an example so you can have a general idea of what a tachinid fly looks like. They are quite bristly. On the right, the tent caterpillar has an egg laid on its head by the tachinid fly, and that's so that the caterpillar isn't able to chew it off. The egg will hatch and develop in the body of the caterpillar, and the fly will emerge at some point later. Here is a cocoon of a western tent moth, and you can see the exit hole. The adults emerge in July, so there is a relatively rapid pupation period that lasts about 12 to 18 days. And on this slide, I have an adult tent moth, Malacosoma californicum pluvial. Um, I'd like to point out here that the western tent moth is also a native species. The damage or defoliation is mostly aesthetic, and it's worse when populations are at an outbreak level, which occurs about every 10 to 11 years. And the populations of this moth species are kept in check by tachinid flies, parasitoid wasps, and a nuclear polyhedrosis virus. Um, the caterpillars and pupae and the adults are all eaten by various species of wildlife as well. On this slide, I have the winter moth, Oporoptera brumata. It's a geometrid moth, and um, unlike the last two moth species, this one is not native to the Pacific Northwest. It is a European transplant that is native to Northern Africa. It was established in the Pacific Northwest sometime around the 1970s. And this species uh, feeds on willow, trembling aspen, paper birch, balsam, poplar, big leaf, maple, gary oaks, and filberts. What I would say about the species is that if you're using iNaturalist, 
Um, sometimes, uh, for, well, for our area, you will see quite a few of these moths posted. Uh, many of them are likely misidentified. They are uh, confused with the native Operoptera bruciata or the native subspecies Operoptera bruciata occidentalis. It is very, very difficult to tell the two apart. The problem area for winter moth is primarily in the eastern half of the United States. And there is a lot of uh, research that neglects to address the spring consumption of many of these caterpillars, including the, this one by birds. Um, also, beetles are voracious predators of the pupa. So check out the reference section. I've got some uh, interesting papers linked so you can read more about the food web. Here's a photo of a native species that is a winter moth look-alike. This is the Bruce Spanworm moth, Operoptera bruciata, or it could possibly be the subspecies Operoptera bruciata occidentalis. Um, I'm not qualified to take it to that level. Um, I did put a link up here to a fellow named Bob Armstrong's uh, website. Um, it's naturebob.com, and um, I, I added this because he does a nice uh, uh, covering of this species and references how caterpillar frass, that's the insect poop, can have a beneficial effect on the plant or tree being defoliated. In a nutshell, when the defoliation takes place in early spring in some species, the affected individual can actually regrow foliage by summer. And the insect frass from the chewed leaves enhances the soil fertility and makes nutrients available for the tree that would otherwise be unavailable. When it happens late in the season, the same basically applies. The frass enhances the soil fertility. The nutrients then are absorbed by the tree more easily than when they lie on the ground decomposing slowly. All examples, or one example of late season defoliation here in the San Juans and Pacific Northwest would be the fall webworm moth caterpillar. They also construct tents and trees, but their defoliation is not seen as much of an issue. The leaves are already on their way out anyway when um, the caterpillars are feeding on. So I found this photo on the internet, but I've heard some horror stories amongst wildlife rehabbers about this actually happening. It's similar to those awful glue traps that people put out for spiders and insects in their homes. There are some extension type sites I've seen online that recommend these sticky tapes for managing winter moth populations. And while they may be effective, biological controls are much safer for wildlife. There are two species of parasitoids that have been introduced for control of winter moth that are very effective. The first one is Cezinus albicans. It's an endoparasitic tachinid fly that parasitizes the caterpillars. And the second one is a Garapon flaviola, an ichneumon wasp, that lays eggs onto the caterpillars. And they are also, again, controlled by the nuclear polyhedrosis virus as well as native beetles, nematodes, and wildlife that eat the pupae that fall on the ground. Also, I'd like to point out that many birds will eat the caterpillars. Um, there's a species called the great tit in Europe, and it's very similar to our chickadee. And they, um, they like to eat the winter moth as well and have been very effective in controlling populations. Okay, so here's the last of the Lepidopteran pests I've got for you. This is the filbert worm moth or Catalina cherry moth, Cydia latifariana. It is in the family Tortricidae, the leaf rollers, not to be confused with the coddling moth, Cydia pominella. It was uh, renamed uh, and reclassified into Cydia. The filbert worm larva is native to North America. And as you can see on this map, I sourced from Moth Photographers Group at Mississippi State, you can see it is more of an East Coast problem than for our area. And I added this photo to show you another place on oaks you may find filbert worm larva inside the oak apples or galls formed on the Gary Oaks by cynipid wasps. 
And I'm going to end the Lepidopteran section here by saying that not all herbivory is bad. Caterpillars feed on tree leaves, but Gary isn't without some defenses. Uh, tannin production. Uh, Gary oak trees can produce tannin um, to fend off uh, the defoliation or herbivory. And in the process of feeding, caterpillars produce a lot of frass, which fertilizes the soil beneath the tree. Caterpillars are food for many other species, primarily birds in the spring. And if you want birds e eating the caterpillars out of the tree, please keep your cats inside so they aren't predating the birds. Okay, so moving away from the Lepidopteran pest and on to another group, uh, this next pest is a species of beetle called weevil. Um, Curculio occidentis is one of the weevils that are considered to be pest of Gary Oaks. The specimen in this particular slide uh, here isn't the same weevil, uh, Curculio occidentis, it is in the genus, um, but weevils are widely distributed and associated with many species of oaks and nut trees in general. I found these on my parents' property in Texas last fall. Curculionidae is a very large family of weevils uh, with approximately 319 species worldwide, and it is super tough to ID these to species level. Here I have the uh, filbert weevil, again, Curculio occidentis, and I wanted to point out that this is a native species to North America. It is naturally associated with endemic oak species and the geographic distribution all the way from southern BC down to Baja, California. And studies have shown that even though this is considered a pest, it only affects about 43 to 58 uh, percent of an acorn crop. That's about half. Um, and in 2021, Steele et al. found that weevil infested acorns with up to 50 percent of the cotyledon remaining are still viable. So even if they're damaged, um, these acorns can still germinate and develop into seedlings. And I have on this slide a picture of a little booklet that I have called the Handy, it's, well, it's a handy, my name, Handy Guide to Galls. It's a uh, common, common insect and mite galls of the Pacific Northwest. It's an older book from 1983 by uh, Hiram LaRue and Joseph Capizzi. It's an excellent reference and you can download this online if you would like, the link is right there. Um, there are a lot of gall species found in association with Gary Oaks. The galls are formed on trees by many different kinds of organisms and too many to cover in today's talk. But again, link here to get your own e-copy of this book. On this slide, I have jumping galls, Neuroteris saltatorius. They are made by the Sinipid gall wasp by, of the same name. They are very much like Mexican jumping beans. And um, these are very, very common on Gary Oaks. They are native to Western North America and range from Texas to Washington all the way up to BC. People don't like them on their Gary Oaks because they can cause midsummer foliar scorching. So from July to August, um, the galls will detach from the leaf and fall to the ground. And once they're down on the ground, they begin to jump around and dance on the ground. Um, it's movement from the larval stage of the wasp inside. Um, there is a little larva inside of these galls that's about the size of a mustard seed. And it's trying to bury itself in the dust and the leaves so it won't desiccate or fall victim to a predator. And um, these galls have two generations. There is a sexual and asexual generation. The sexual or gamic generation forms uh, inconspicuous clusters of leaf blister galls comprised of males and females. In the spring and later, usually around mid-June, the agamic or asexual generations form single spherical galls. Uh, very tiny, about one millimeter on the underside of the leaves. And they do it on the underside of the leaves so that the galls don't desiccate. And if you have a chance um, to watch the Rob Irwin video linked here on YouTube of the California jumping gall wasps, and there's also another great jumping gall 
video linked here, the Facebook link. I believe that was California Master Naturalist where I found that. So while I was fascinated with the behavior of the jumping galls, I did want to point out these are considered a pest, at least in British Columbia and the northern part of the range where they seem to be more abundant. Reading literature around the geographic distribution and what is native versus non-native can sometimes be confusing. So um, although this species of jumping gall is native along the west coast, the Samoan Islands and Vancouver Islands sort of fell outside of this, and the galls here are considered introduced. So this is a new bug to the community and they're not making themselves very welcome, at least not if you're a butterfly. So here's one reason they are somewhat of a problem. There was a 2010 study in ecology titled Impact of an Invasive Oak Gall Wasp on a Native Butterfly, a test of plant-mediated competition. Uh, researchers working on this found with increasing gall wasp density, the Butterfly performance decreased, and this is the Propertius dusky winged butterfly, Arenus propertius. Um, so, this was attributed to reduced plant quality. Uh, so, there was increased carbon, reduced nitrogen, and water available in the leaves. The gall formers um, redirect nutrients systemically and they concentrate them in the gall tissue. So, when they do this, the uh, galls make the leaves less nutritious for the butterfly caterpillars. And for some reason, uh, Neuroterra saltatorius is occurring at higher densities in British Columbia. For the butterfly, uh, which ranges all the way down into Baja, the impact from the galls is less serious in populations uh, within this more southern range of the galls, the Neuroterra saltatorius population, than they are in, in British Columbia. So what this says to me is that the pest predators or the community guild that helps balance everything out hasn't caught up yet. Maybe we need more time for things to balance, but climate refugees may very well outcompete some species, unfortunately. Here we have yet another group uh, of a, with a pest species. Uh, this is oak phylloxera, and it is an introduced aphid-like pest. Um, it was introduced in the 1960s from Europe, and it's affecting our Gary oak trees. I would say this one probably is uh, one of the most concerning. Um, the variety of concern, and there are many different species of phylloxera, but the one we're going to talk about here is phylloxera glabra, the non-native introduced species. It feeds on the undersides of the leaves of your Gary oak trees, causing chlorotic mottling, browning, and loss of leaves. Canadian researchers estimate that approximately 10% of the trees susceptible will die from continuous defoliation, but the good thing is that 90% show resistance to phylloxera glabra. Um, this uh, pest causes chronic midsummer scorching and defoliation, but um, sometimes not death. Um, going back to a 1993 publication I found by Wayne Erickson, he stated that many of the scorched oaks were mistakenly believed to be dead and cut down. So um, don't give up on your Gary oak tree. Give it a few more seasons. And m my feeling is that the, as they get older, they will have more natural resistance. Um, so this species of phylloxera has at least two generations. On the left, you see one of the winged adults. I used this photo uh, that was generously contributed by Sean Hubbard. Um, and on the far right, I have a close-up of one of the aptera or wingless adults. Uh, those are the ones that lay eggs. And this species will lay eggs in a concentric circle, and they go around one round and then they do it again and add more eggs and I think there could be I look it up fact check me but I believe there could be over a hundred eggs um, in the middle you can see the chlorotic spotting on the leaf uh, this is caused by the phylloxera and feeding and I've got a couple of links up here if you want to know more about this species or about phylloxera in general um,
Now on the next slide, I have some pest predators of Phylloxera. Um, there is an Asian lady beetle on the right, Harmonia axeritis. Uh, in the middle, um, there is a predaceous bug, Camp Campylo neura bergula, and on the far left, I have a couple of European earwigs, Forficula ar auricularia, and earwigs can sometimes be considered garden pests, but I have found them preying on the uh, caterpillars of the uh, western tent caterpillar um, in some of the uh, tents in our trees um, in the summertime. So they can help control pest populations as well. They are predatory. Um, and here I included a pest to watch for. This is the Mediterranean oak borer, Xyloborus monographus. It's about one eighth of an inch long. It was recovered in Napa and Sonoma counties in California. It's associated with drought. The beetles excavate tunnels and plant fungal gardens in Gary oak trees, or I'm sorry, I misspoke. Um, the fungi uh, take nutrients from the xylem the tissue that moves nutrients from a tree's roots to stems and leaves, and the beetles and their larvae eat the mycelium, the vegetative part of the fungus, and fungal spores. So fungi eat the trees and the beetles eat the fungi. Um, I wanted to clarify where I misspoke here. So infestations in California are starting in the upper canopy of trees, not like they do in their native range, but Gary oak trees are evidently not impacted yet. However, they're concerned uh, because it has impacted other species of oak, so studies are underway to assess the vulnerability of Quercus gariana to this beetle. Um, they, can, they can transmit a couple of species of fungi that are concerning. The Raphaelia montei wilt, causes wilting disease in Fusarium solani, um, but I would like to point out that um, Boring beetles are really a symptom of the overall health of the tree being in serious decline. And I would say that drought is the number one cause of this. So beetles move in when a tree is already dying. They are not going to cause the tree to die or be the reason the tree is dying. The tree is already dying. So the beetle's job is to help get in and decompose the tree and recycle those nutrients to make them available for other organisms growing. And uh, so the beetles are doing what they're supposed to do, but the real problem is uh, the tree is not healthy and it's stressed from drought or climate change or um, land use changes. All of these things can impact the tree. And that's all, folks. Uh, make Gary happy. Uh, I suggest you water your trees throughout the dry summer. Uh, plant a diversity of native species. You can go to Washington Native Plant Society uh, for a list of native plants for our area. Master Gardeners also is a good resource. Um, please refrain from using BT. Um, to control caterpillars. It kills all Lepidoptera species, including the ones that we like and want to save, like the Propertius dusky wing butterfly. Um, please don't put up sticky tape traps. These are like glue traps on trees, and they will uh, get a lot of non-target species. Be patient. Gary will take many years to grow. Again, I can't stress this enough. We are not going to see a 200-year-old Gary oak tree from a seedling we plant right now. We're doing this for future generations. And advocate for climate, uh, climate change and it, conservation, habitat conservation. We can make a difference going forward um, in how we live and what we place importance on. The next section is going to have references for you to take a look at to bring yourself up to speed. If you have any questions, I'll include my email at the end. Feel free to email me. Um, and I would like to thank April Randall for this wonderful, for these wonderful illustrations she provided. Uh, April Randall, the Wendy Painter, you can find her on Orcas Island, Washington. Thank you again for watching and um, have a great afternoon.